Hello and welcome to CGMA's interview with the Masters. Today we have Robbie Rebels. He's teaching an awesome creature design class. It's a new one, creature design for film and games. And uh, registration started, so we have about... Registration started uh, June 8th and it will go until July 24th. So please feel free to check classes out. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Bobby. Hello, hello. How's it going? Um, so I guess uh, I should talk a little bit about my background and where I've been. And does that sound good? Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Well, oh, sorry. Um, uh, really quickly, feel free to ask questions anytime in the chat box, and me and Bobby will do our best to get to all of them. Uh, go ahead. Okay, um, so I guess I'll I'll talk a little bit about my background and how I actually got started, and because everybody's journey is different in concept art. So um, I've been drawing since I was a wee little one, watching movies and uh, horror movies like Aliens and Predator and all the good stuff, and I knew that I definitely wanted to draw creatures more than anything, and as I got older, I kept drawing. I didn't give up, especially in my teenage years. Um, my my college years, I majored in industrial design, believe it or not. And my focus in product design was drawing cars. And it was fun. I I had a lot of good times in college with that. But in the back of my mind, I still knew that I wanted to do creatures and concept art for games. So what I did was I, I, I had a hodgepodge portfolio. And it was a little bit of product design and then a little bit of creatures. And any time that I would send my portfolio out to employers, they really didn't know what to hire me for because I I didn't gear my portfolio towards it. So um, after after college, I had a design job, but I just wasn't happy. So that was that was the turning point. It was about 2007, 2008. I, I had the design job in 2008. And then it just got to the point where, you know what, I'm just going to completely redo my portfolio and um, get into what I really want to do. So I started to study creatures and anatomy and, and I just kept drawing and um, there's this belief that we need a certain style and a, to get a style really quickly and that's anybody listening out there is just totally not true. Just don't worry about your style yet. Uh, I worried about drawing mechanics first and then later came the style. Just when you do it enough, you develop your own style. So I did that. And um, I b believe it or not, I got accepted into Art Center, and I couldn't do it because of the tuition. So I was out there in California. I had absolutely no idea what was going on. So I I realized that and this was in 2010. So I needed to come back home, and at the time it was Cincinnati, Ohio. So I came back, and I realized that. I needed to regroup and really, really buckle down into my artwork. So I became a full-time teacher for industrial design drawing at my alma mater, which was University of Cincinnati. And I taught for four years there, I taught foundation studios. People uh, taught them how to draw basic shapes. And then I taught the upperclassmen how to sketch products and and use Photoshop and you know markers, all the good stuff. So after that, I I'm here in New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm doing freelance work. I live with my wife, and um, yeah. So that's that's basically my background in a nutshell. Uh, so yeah. Um, so I guess. Should I just show the my artwork now? Just kind of give a feeling yeah. for my okay. That so works. I'll share my screen. <clears throat> okay. 
can you see this okay? Yes. All right, great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go over my artwork, and I, I've had a lot of people ask me about my actual process of what I do, like how do I get my highlights and things like that. So I'll go over that. Um, so this is a gorilla insect. The idea behind this was what would a gorilla look like if it evolved in another dimension on earth? And so that, that was, I love drawing insects. I think there's a lot of really awesome stuff about drawing exoskeletons in general. So I sketch this traditionally. I use a 4B, a 6B, and a Prismacolor pencil. So you, you don't have to uh, use those. You can use others, but I like 6Bs because they you can get light and dark with them. Black Prisma, you can get very dark. It just shows up well when you scan it. So what I do is I, I sketch these out, and then once I scan them in, I'll play with the tone. I'll use levels in Photoshop because moleskin paper, which is what I draw on, it's my preference. Of all the years of drawing, I've been drawing on marker paper, Strathmore, charcoal paper. It's just um, moleskin is the smoothest to me. So, yeah, I, I scan it in. I mess with levels. I change the, the mid-tones, and then I change the... Uh, uh, I use the gamma slider underneath the midtones, and what it does is it it makes all of the really really faint pencil marks show up, because a lot of times when we scan in our work, we lose a lot of the details. We mm -hmm. don't know where it went. So if you use the the midtone, um, it's like if you open up levels, it's the it's the midtone slider underneath the the chart, the graph that you can see. So I play with that until I get what I want. And then what I do is I, I drop the actual um, color of the paper. And then I just, I, I go to the color wheel and I just use a lighter version of it. And that gives me the highlight. And I don't change it to grayscale. I just leave it the way it is. And that's really my technique. I, um, I've been doing it probably for about two or three years now. So for this one, this was actually for a creature of the week contest on conceptart.org. And if you guys aren't familiar with that, it's, it's a, it's a really awesome contest that you can do weekly and people vote on it. So this was a, uh, a warthog dragon and it was a lot of fun. I had to mix two animals together. I love dragons and just sketching earth creatures are, is a lot of fun. So I, I started drawing this warthog and wondered what the heck is this thing going to look like if it had a bunch of scales and spikes. So I just went into it. <clears throat> I'm, I changed the tone of the paper to, to a slight bluish hue. And then for those particular highlights, I still did my technique where I eye dropped it, but I, I color dodged just to show. So like another type of light source bouncing off of it. So um, it would show up. And then another one, this is a dragon, it's called the Zinguara. And this is a flightless dragon. So I am, I am super picky about dragons in general. So growing up, uh, you know, I'm 35 years old. So I remember when Dragon Slayer came out. I mean, I was a little kid, but it had a really cool dragon in it. Uh, a lot of dragons, they tend to look kind of goofy, and I wanted to make sure that this one didn't look goofy. Uh, if anybody have seen Dragonheart, um, great movie. Love it. Yeah, it's but, a great movie. Yeah, it's a great movie. I remember when that came out. I think it was like 96, 97. It's like, oh, man, Sean Connery is the dragon. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the face was kind of cartoony, and it's just like <laughs> I, I like to draw a lot of demons and, and, and scary stuff, so... I have to make these faces pretty intimidating and weird. So um, I just kind of went on a tangent there. Sorry about that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so I wanted to make, I wanted to be a little different with this dragon. I, I put some highlights in. So um, just to kind of give a rundown of how this actually happens. So I'll go to, 
I'll go to this sketch right here, and then I'll open up Levels, which is Control L. I'll set it off to the side. Um, notice how my layers all on the background layers. So you don't want to make any more layers. This output level slider is what I was talking about. This is what makes the entire thing dark. You have to be careful though because the more you go to the left, the more you're adding a, a mid-tone gray to it. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword. The darker you get, the lighter you can get with the highlights and the more they show up. But at the same time, it's not as vibrant and bright. So what happens is I will change it. I'll make it go down just a little bit. I won't mess with anything up here. I don't really need to unless I have to use this one, the middle one only. You don't use the one on the right. You don't need it. But if I move the middle one to the right, it brings up all the black, all the darkest of dark. So I hit OK, and then I'll simply eye drop the background color, and then this is where it shows up. So then what I do is I pick a lighter version of it, right about, right about there. So then when I color, it offers a highlight. So then I can go in, I'll zoom in, and then I'll start adding in highlights. And that's really my technique. So the, the brush you use, it really depends. Some people have custom brushes. Other people, you can just use the standard round brush and turn the opacity down. So, hmm. and there you have it. And I just keep going. And I, I try to pick areas where I think the light will hit most. So, this was the a juggernaut character, and so I'll eye drop this. And then I'll go in here, let's find out where it went. So you can see it went to the little bit more of the tan side. And I go up here. And then I'll turn the, I'm going to turn the uh, opacity down just a little bit. So all I was doing was just hitting F for people that don't know. And that makes the, um, all of the stuff around the sides disappear. And I'll just add highlights like this. This brush is a little bit chalkier than um, what I typically use. I have my own brush presets right here, so I have this one called Awesome Sketch Brush. <laughs> I went to um, digitalbrushes.tumblr, and a lot of the industry professionals just dump their custom brushes on that site, and you can download them, and it's really good. So this brush is a little better. It's more of a chalk brush, so that's, that's what cool. it looks like. Yeah, and I just, I turn, there we go, that's that's good. So then I'll just go in and I'll, um, I can turn the opacity down on the actual brush to about 80, 79, just so it's not like full blast. And then when you back up, you'll see that. And then sometimes, uh, I'll show you, okay, so for this, this was uh, one of my more well-known creatures. This was called the Jeropa, and I made the shadow show up quite a bit. And the way I did that is literally I just make a new layer like that, and I set that to multiply. And then what I do is I eye drop the... the base color, like the local color of the creature. So somewhere around like this mid-tone blue, I'll make the brush bigger by hitting the right bracket. And since this is on multiply, I'm going to turn that layer down to about 80. And I just add in a shadow where I think that it should be. Because a lot of times, no matter how how dark you push the pencil and then you scan it in, sometimes the shadows don't show up much. Mm -hmm. So then I, I back up like that. And then if I need to counter it with, you know, another highlight. So wherever this shows up, so this is when I eye dropped it. So let's say this is my local color. Wherever that shows up, I just try to go up near white but not perfectly white. And then I'll just slowly add in highlights. It's probably not bright enough, so I probably do need to get 
brighter. Yeah, like this. So when you when you back up, it re you really have the contrast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a question from Joe. He's asking yeah. how big these drawings are. Okay. Um, this particular one was in my moleskin sketchbook, uh, eight and a half by eleven. Um, okay. The juggernaut. This one was in my Graphics 360 pad, which is a, it's a marker paper, and that was 11 by 14. I typically do not go higher than 11 by 14. Um, the majority of my sketches that I'll be showing are all in my Moleskin sketchbook. Uh, it's, it's a lot of detail, but there are tricks and, and showing a lot of detail without you painstakingly doing it. So, um, So my next work, this one, this was moleskin. This is the natural color of the paper. So a lot of my stuff has that creamy, like tannish color. Uh, just offers a really good opportunity for highlights. So for for this one, most of the work shows up right about here inside the color picker. So that's where the tone is. And then I'll go up to about right here. So what it does is it acts like a, a slightly warm light shining on everything and then I just put the highlight in like that and it you can't just plop the highlights in because you have to treat it as if it's a photograph and it's real light coming down so for this particular log I had to make sure that like okay well this this guy's walking with his his little dog it's it's a personal project of mine. It's a traveling nomad and his dog. It's his best friend, and I've been drawing quite a bit of them. Um, you know, just to show where the light might be poking through trees or somewhere, like I'll have light down there, down on the water, and then it's done. You don't want to overwork it. So, hmm. um, so this next piece, this is for uh, a daily spit paint group called uh, oh, Daily Spit! It's a Facebook group called Daily Spit Paint, and every day at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I think new themes are posted. So this particular theme was uh, biomorphic, and then another theme was let's see, actually it combined three themes. It was biomorphic, uh, owl mage, and night. So I made a biomorphic night owl mage. I had no idea what that is. I just I just drew it. Uh, <laughs> owls are really fun to draw, especially if you want to make them into characters. But I really like putting animal heads into warrior poses. So I just did that. This was a 30-minute sketch because you have a 30-minute time limit. And the trick to doing this particular type of sketch in 30 minutes is... Um, so I'll get another color brush here, is to get all of this outlined in first. So I got his head outlined. And then, because this was done traditionally, so this was not a digital drawing, but I can kind of show you my the way I do it. I'll have the outline in, and I'll have the eyes outlined in pencil. And then I literally just take my pencil, and I shade in one direction, and then I turn the sketchbook physically and I shade in another direction. So when you hit a minimum of three different directions with your pencil, you start to see a really nice um, value. And it, what happens is, uh, I just drew on it, but all of that in there, it looks pretty smooth. And you can get that by going in three different directions. Just make sure you don't grip the pencil tightly. So and it, and it actually does work. So if you guys want to test it out, go ahead. Um, this is another character that I did. His name's Beepo. He's a little armadillo. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. He, <laughs> he uh, he's finding his long lost brother, and I just had I had no plan when I started to draw this. This was eight and a half by eleven too. Um, I believe this is all black Prismacolor with a little bit of 4B. If you guys are wondering why I chose 4B and 6B, it's more of just trial and error until I found pencils that I liked. I don't like pure H's because no matter how hard you push with those, you can't get really dark. 
-hmm. With yeah, with the four B and a six B, it adds a little bit more texture. Um, the six B, especially, and then the the black Prisma color, man, a lot of texture. Like for instance, this and in here, all of that. It's a really good texture that you get. You can zoom in on here, because you can't. You can see the difference between that and then the 4B pencils here. Uh, the 4B tends to fill in the gaps of all the little ridges, but the the 6B or the um, black Prisma just it it really has some tooth to it. So mm -hmm. and it offers like a really really nice black mark. Um. I was curious. Um, in the past, yeah. I've I've sketched with black prisma and um, a graphite as well. Do you ever experience where like they have this weird blending, like they don't blend well together? Yeah, yeah. And uh, actually, I I was gonna mention that whenever I do these sketches. Uh, okay, for instance, this next one. So this is this is called dark dwarf. What I did is I did the outline of him and then I used a 4B first so all the 4B you can see the strokes look pretty close together and it looks like it filled in a lot of a lot more area I did that very very lightly and then I went over top of it with up here like in the darker areas with um, a black prisma but I kept it really really sharp so the the more dull that black prisma is the it's just it kinda sucks so you have to make sure it's sharp at all times and then I actually like to grip my pencil pretty far back on the actual pencil so a lot of people like to draw as if they're writing but they keep the pencil gripped really really close to the the wood like the sharpened part right you want, yeah you want to back it up and sharpen the pencil and just um, and when you start to sketch have your pinky glide your hand so you don't let the palm rest on the paper a lot and then what it'll do is it'll allow you to have a really f nice touch. Um, so like you can see the directions that I was going with these pencil strokes. The black prism was right on top of it, but I barely pushed hard, and that that seems to help. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, the next one I did was all black prisma. This was you can tell the difference. It's more, it's darker. It's more vibrant. You can see the texture. Um, this is called the Enzoda, and the influence I used is the wildebeest so back in December I I just started these month of study series where I was taking real-life animals um, and combining them so this one was a uh, the wildebeest and then I used some horns like from a cattle and I put in some extra horns here just to make it look more creaturesque um, and really the way I started this was with a black prisma I kept it super sharp and I think I went six to seven different directions while filling one area with value it might seem like a lot but man does it go fast it goes really quickly and before you know it you'll start to see this entire area like be filled um, and also what what it allows and this is really cool is when I did the veins here on the leg, I'll zoom in. When you get a really good uh, area of value, or it looks like the coating is good, and you barely push hard within that, you can start to see an indent. So, like up here where the oblique muscles are, um, I just I barely pushed on those lines, and all of a sudden it literally looked like those were indents and in muscles, and I barely had to work for it. So, it might be something to think about mm -hmm. while drawing. Um, oh, one more thing. Uh, I I tend to not worry about going outside of the lines when I sketch. I think that's really important. So I'll show you, a, show you an example. I drew a gazelle, and while developing this technique that I have, I tried to tr uh, treat my pencil as if it were a paintbrush. Um, for instance. Uh, a really good art. Or, let's see who who does really good lines and then makes them fade. Oh, Greg Manchus. Okay, mm -hmm. if, if you're not familiar with Greg Manchus, he's an amazing painter. So if you look at his torso right here, I'll zoom in. So a lot of times in traditional painting, you see 
sharp lines or sharp edges, and then you see where it looks like paint is fading off into the background in this way. Here's another example where I did it to the leg. Here, I'll circle that a little better. So I have a hard line here, and all of a sudden, it's this fade off. It almost looks like it's walking through mist. So what happens is, and this was done by trial and error when I was sketching this stuff. It happened a couple of years ago. I was like, huh, it kind of looks like I'm actually using a brush here instead of a pencil. So, and it gives the illusion that this living thing is is in a an actual environment and, and part of the, you know, part of the paper. So I just started doing it, um, and I literally didn't care about going outside of the line. So when I was, you know, drawing this leg, I started shading, and then I was just like, oh, oh well, I'm just gonna leave it there, <laughs> you know, and just you can get dark where you need to get dark and then it takes care of itself so uh, when you go into detail do you also hold your pencil uh, in the more further top like you um, yeah actually I, I never really go I never really grip it close to the end until I'm doing stuff uh, should I I'm just trying to give an example okay so this is where I did it. I had to. Uh, this is called the Kitu. Um, just a. I was combining birds. This is more of my month of study series where uh, the first month I did land mammals, the second month I did fish, and then the third month I did flying creatures. So I'll zoom in here. Um, I, I had to grip the pencil pretty close to get these little feathers in. It just it was more comfortable. Mm -hmm. But this was a mixture of a a bird and a spider. Everybody hates spiders, and I wanted to scare people. So um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's just a really good technique to use while doing animals if you just combine stuff. Because when you look out in nature, we got some really funky looking creatures living on Earth, and they look really alien and really scary, uh, especially underwater. Oh man. Yeah. So yeah, just just crazy stuff. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the key to. There's another animal called the corba. Uh, this is more of a African safari type influence where I looked at giraffes. Um, what is that? Uh, the tapir and uh, the warthog. Try to combine those, and it just just happened. I I have a, an image board up at all times at 11 by 17 just to, to have influence for me. So if I'm sketching at my desk, I'll look over at the computer screen and I'll be like, huh, what does this warthog look like? Oh, there it is. So it really helps. Um, so this next creature is called the Luric. And for this one, I sketched the skull. And I looked at, I believe it was the male lion skull if I'm not mistaken and I also looked at the saber-tooth tiger so it was a combination just adds believability to it and one thing that that I'm going to stress about in in my class is showing anatomy from real life animals but also you know what what's going on underneath that skin like what do the muscles look like what do what does the skull look like because the more believable it is um, the more an art director will tend to use it. So, uh, yeah, this is called the Lyric. It's more of a, uh, how should I put it, almost like a Narnia feel. Mm. And, yeah, it's just a lot of fun to do. We have another question from uh, yeah. Joe. He's asking if you, do you thumbnail these before you start them to work out composition? Uh, some of them I do, some of them I don't. When I do... When I do the really crazy stuff, like for instance this one, I did do a thumbnail just because the body was so crazy. Now with things like the gazelle and the kitu, um, bird bodies and, and gazelle bodies are already there as an influence. So I could literally open up a picture of a deer on my computer screen and I'll take most of the design cues from it, adding in my own design liberties. So, like for the for the head, all the um, the horns here, I made it up. But 
that's a, it's a small area to make up. I don't need to really thumbnail that. Same thing with uh, this, these back shapes. Um, when I when I sketched, let's see, the pyramid, I did use thumbnails, and this was uh, only because I had absolutely no idea what this thing was going to look like. <laughs> it was oh, a comment. That's really it's a, cool. Yeah, I wanted to make something that it would definitely bite you, it would hurt, but also recognizable. So the three animals are the electric eel, the sea crab, and the and the uh, arapaima. It's a fish. It's a freshwater fish. That's where the everything is arapaima from here down. So it's the tail. They have like really fat ends on their bodies. Um, is that a Amazonian fish or like an Amazon? Um, I I believe so. I was I literally just Googled crazy looking fish. <laughs> <laughs> and I found it. I'm like, okay, that's it. That's my influence. So that's really cool. Thanks. Uh, oh, and I kind of skipped over this. This is the Goratika. Don't ask me how I name these things. I have no idea. I just try to try to come up with something cool. <laughs> I could call it Jim, but I don't. You know. <laughs> um, a lot of people are terrified of birds, and I try to touch on a lot of phobias when I draw. Mm -hmm. So this was a combination of. Um, the Archaeopteryx, which is an ancient bird, it's long dead. Uh, a bearded vulture, and I believe those are the only two. I actually did look at a Velociraptor too, but most of it was the beard. The bearded vulture is probably one of the coolest birds I've ever seen, and I I had to draw it. I was going to do the regular vulture when that thing is hideous looking, and I just I wasn't in the mood to draw something super hideous, even though this could be considered hideous. Um, okay, and to really touch base on phobias, spiders again. So this one is called Trapped in a Web. This was for Daily Spit Paint again for the, it's a Facebook group. And I wanted to sketch this absolutely monstrous spider with this little dude trapped in a web, and we don't know if he's going to get to the sword or not. So... Oh, um, it, it went viral actually it did really well on the internet to the point where people were messaging me like that is terrifying it's like, okay. and, I, and I was thinking to myself like yes mission accomplished <laughs> so uh, yeah, I this was a 30 minute sketch um, I just used the technique of doing a, a really really faint outline of the spider and just I went to town on sketching in different directions um so it's, you'll see a lot of stuff going this way and this way, just a lot of web drawings, and it worked. So that's trapped in a web. <laughs> Hope it terrifies. <laughs> uh, so the next thing I'm going to show you is actually a, a personal project of mine. I've, like I said before, during that the this one, which is the river crossing, which is a, a little traveling nomad, and then is a little dog. So his name is Shadoa. And the little dog is named Kenla. It's like a giant wolf uh, German Shepherd hybrid. And they travel the land together. So what I started to do was like, you know what would be cool? Um, if he made a journal of his travels. So, And he was an actual artist. So I started drawing these things where you know, he would see certain things throughout the day. This is his, that's Kenla and Shadoa together. Um, that's here's river crossing here. Here they are again. Uh, like, what do they do during the day? Like, what what do they encounter? And if he would date it and write about it, this is far in the future. I don't know. I just thought it'd be kind of neat to do. That's very um, cool. Are they on Earth? In. Are they on Earth? It it is Earth. It's it's post apocalyptic. So it's way. I mean, what's the year? Yeah, three thousand oh, okay, okay. nine hundred forty eight. So I have no idea what made the Earth do that. Maybe nuclear holocaust, who knows. Um, so this is the page two of it, and I'll zoom in. So I, I just started sketching these, and I have a creature here called the Swamp, it's called a Swamp Protector. Uh, they came in contact with it. Just like little things throughout the day, like what do they do? 
So I don't know where it'll go because I had uh, the Kickstarter campaign of my book, which um, actually I should I should talk about that, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, yeah. Go for it. Okay. Um, yeah. So those listening, I recently had a book successfully funded on Kickstarter called Subconscious Sketches from a Dark Place, and it is a book about all of these sketches in a 128 page book and uh, I got it delivered to me about two days ago and I've been mailing them out to backers you can go on Kickstarter and check out that actual page or you can actually purchase a book if you like on Etsy and my shop is titled just my name so it's Bobby Rebholtz um, and then you'll find it there it's the only listing in it too so, uh, yeah, I'm trying to get that out. Uh, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's When I started drawing all of these, I realized, wow, I have a lot of these moleskin sketches, like these daily spit paints. I just should just make a book about it, and hopefully I can inspire artists to, to draw more, um, to keep sketchbooks. And uh, it's it's been going pretty well. So... Let's see. Do I have any more up here? Um, I can show more work because I have a lot in here. So uh, let's see. I can bring up an alien profile. And what I'm about to show is one of the things that I want students to sketch in the uh, drawing creatures for games and film. So this is a head bust. And right here, this took about, I would say, three to five hours, just because I was, I was thinking about it more. Um, it's a tighter drawing. And one of the assignments for one of the weeks is to draw a head bust of the creature. So it'll be side view like this, and then you'll do one that's front view too. Um, it just really helps give personality to the actual creatures. That's why for my Jeropa creature, I added in that head. Uh, oh, and I, people are, people were asking me, what is going on in there? <laughs> like, what is, what is all, I don't know if you can see this, hold on. I'll, uh, I'll brighten the color. Like, what is all that? So, the creature is actually a hermaphrodite. It's a male and female, and it's pregnant. And the whole idea behind this creature was it can procreate on its own to sustain a healthy number of creatures for its society. So that was the whole idea behind it, and I just kind of went with it. Um, yeah, that thing is very scary, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually started to sculpt this in ZBrush. Uh, oh, I need to awesome. Get, yeah, I need to get back to it because I started to realize, wow, there could be a lot of stuff going on on its back, and I have no idea what's going on back there. So um, I'll have to sketch that out before I do it. And so we'll we'll see where that goes. Cool. Um, yeah. We have another question from Joe. He's wondering sure. if you have any um, thumbnail process that you could share from these images. Uh, I sure do. Um, okay, so I have I have some thumbnails for that warthog creature, and. This, I was working uh, just the head. So the body was, like I said before, if you if you could just open up a photo of a warthog, you'll get the body right there. I didn't really need to work anything out. Um, I took my own creative liberties and just added spikes everywhere, which helped. The head, on the other hand, was a little different, mainly because I wanted to find out where the sharp teeth were here, I'll, I'll darken this up. Where the sharp teeth were, how big the horns needed to be, and if I wanted to, you know, fatten the face. And it kind of, it kind of just went from there. So, um, yeah, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, another, s I'll show you some digital thumbnails that I've done. This was for a creature of the week contest actually called Alien Ankle Biters, which was a ton of fun. Uh, so I'll show you that. And like I said, for my class, uh, this down here was just, you can actually ignore Arda. Arda is 
a personal project that I was doing and it was a planet with all of these ankle biters um, like infesting it so this these were my thumbnail sketches for them uh, so I have a bunch over here on the left and I numbered them this was digital so I just took a gray brush and I just sketched it out and then I picked which ones I liked and I brought them over to here so for for my class, you do have the option of sketching traditionally or digitally, whatever you're comfortable with. We won't be doing much color work. It's mostly sketch and line work. So stuff like this is okay. I mean, if you want to plop some color in, you know, go right ahead, but most of it's just sketching. Um, and then more thumbnail work. I think that's it as far as showing that. Let's see what I had in here now. Yeah. So hopefully that's good. Um, hopefully that answered your question, Joe. Um, and then what I can do is show, I can actually show some stuff I've done for the television show Face Off, if um, you guys want to see that. Um, yeah, let's, cool. yeah, OK. And obviously, I won't show anything that has not come out yet. Like, I can't show season 11, but I can show season 10. <laughs> um, let's see, what do I have in here? I wonder what this is. Okay, so this is uh, this is at the very end of season 10. Wow, that's and creepy. It is very creepy. It, uh, so, <laughs> it's for the finale. Um, this guy and girl, this is for a short film that they... They, are you familiar with Face Off? Like, do you watch the show? I am familiar. That's the one where they uh, compete, right, and see who they yeah, do, yeah. Like, makeup and mm -hmm. creature Yeah, they, they do the makeup. So this particular story was they had to uh, go inside and um, inspect this weird satanic writing on the barn floor, and all of a sudden this demon shows up. And it kills one of the one of the people. So what happens is the person possessed. <laughs> so for this one, he got yeah he got possessed, and all of this weird blood and this weird stuff started to show up. So um, and the and the female, the girlfriend of the guy, just walks in and he sees this and he's just like, oh my god! And then it cuts out. So, <laughs> man, yeah, it's it's crazy stuff. Uh, I'll show you some earlier stuff that I've done. Let's see. Okay, I'll go so back to season eight. They take um, your designs and your drawings and then they they actually make them, right? Well, what's different about it is they actually have the makeup already made. What uh -huh. I what I have to do is when you watch the episode, you'll see sketches splashed up on the screen about midway through. So the makeup artists do not draw those. We do. There's me and about three other concept artists that do it. And we have to put in our own creative liberties to where it's it's not the same as the final makeups that show up. So what it does is it it surprises the audience. And that's oh, I see. yeah, that's what happens. Um, try to uh, I want to show, try to get into uh, some good ones here. This was a fun one. So this is for season eight. This is a sketch I did. Uh, just this grotesque water creature. This was uh, digitally sketched and plopped some color in, and. Um, put in some texture brushes so a lot of the, I guess I should go over the brushes that I like using so may, maybe that would help um, if that's okay with you yeah of course okay cool these are all the brushes I use on the side here's the problem and the habit that artists like to get into and that is oh my gosh all these really cool brushes to download and then what happens is this I will go up here to my brush list I have 685 brushes. <laughs> and guess what? I use <laughs> uh, four. <laughs> so so here, here I was going like this. I'm going down and down. It's like, where's that? 
oh my gosh, where is that opaque crosshatch number 3010? Like, I had no <laughs> idea. So I just I made my own palette. Um, so what I'll use is Awesome Sketch Brush, which is that one. And then I'll use the Corrosion Brush, which is really cool. The Corrosion Brush is awesome because it makes it look like the texture on there, like something's actually corroding. Oh. Yeah, it's really cool. That was actually from a brush that called... Um, oh, what was it? Blur's Sketch Brush 4.0, and you can actually Google it. And I think it's a, it's from a Japanese website, and it's uh, you don't have to be able to read Japanese. You can see the downloadable brush set, but he's an awesome artist. He calls himself Blur, and he just made these brushes. Um, I used one called Gritty Paint, which is this one which is a really fun one, and then I use Rectangle Tooth. And I got these, the Gritty Paint and the Rectangle Tooth from digitalbrushes.tumblr. It's a really, really awesome site. Um, a lot of the artists from, like, Magic the Gathering, uh, I know, I think Dave Raposa has a lot on there, Sparth, all of his brushes are on there for his Halo environment painting, so it's, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. You can just yeah, download... Great resource. Oh, yeah, so you're familiar with it. Um, okay, so I guess I can show more more face-off stuff. Uh, let's see. That's Season 8. Let's show, let's show some Season 9. How's, the, I, how's working on the show? Do they give you, a, a, like, how fast do <laughs> you to turn these around? Um, a week. You have a week, and it gets kind of tough. So I'm going to show you this guy. <laughs> so he, awesome. he, was, he, he was an experiment that didn't work out too well as far as being a scientist and messing with chemicals. Um, so to, to answer your question, we either have individual sketches like this or we have the tough ones where it is literally a, oops, we have a group sketch and we have to we have to draw these things grouped together with many different characters in one sheet. And see, I I don't remember which episode. We're, I don't want to like make you guys flip through all these. This might be one. Nope, it's not. It was the same one. Okay, but anyway, you have like five characters on one sheet, and you have like five days to do it. So, depending on how much detail you really want to put in these. Depends on whether or not you're going to get these finished or not. So, I see. Yeah, but um, do you do you get like a a theme to go along for that week? Yes. Or? Yeah. Yeah. You get. Uh, I get emailed to me the entire episode. What the theme is, what the creatures and characters have to have on exactly, and what has to be going on with their body. So, uh, and, and they have to be specific, too. Um, to give you an example, I'll show you, I'll show you one. Okay, so here is, here's a group sketch like that. So I had to put these two together. This character had to be um, looking like a warthog, had to be carrying that mallet, and then she had to be all spiky and and carrying a mace. So, yeah. And you can put in your own details, too. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah. We have a question from Joe. He's yeah. wondering if you can share about how your freelancing works, a little bit about the process. Okay. Um, my My freelancing... How should I put this? So face-off is my main one, <clears throat> and what I do is I always make sure that in my portfolio I only want to show the work that I want to get hired for. So I got hired for face-off because of my creature stuff, and whenever I freelance, I try to I try to designate certain times during the day that I'm working on this stuff. Um, 
I don't know, how should I put it, evenly? And was his question geared more towards what I do on a daily basis, or? Um, let's see. Because, I, I mean, I can go into, like, the, what my day consists of. Maybe that'll help. Yeah, sure. Okay, That'd be good. okay. Uh, so my day is, I get up and I treat it as if I'm going to work. So I have to stay organized, for one. So anybody freelancing out there listening to this, I'll show you how I set up my folders. So right here, I have... I have all my clients. So these are the clients that I use. Um, Subterranean Games, some of them are individuals. Uh, Imagine FX, Games Workshop, and then within the folders. So for Face Off, I have to be super technical because there's a lot of work in here. And my advice is the more work you put up and you don't have an external hard drive, please put this on Dropbox. <laughs> you have to save this stuff. Um, I, I realized this about uh, a year ago only because I started to think, like, I literally have thousands of documents. What if my computer just fries right now? I am I'm dead. So I had to make sure that everything is prioritized. So I have folders for invoices, um, which you should always have an invoice, a... I make sure I have all important documents, like if they send me an NDA and I sign it, it goes in that folder. And then I have all my work. So like season eight, episode one, two, three, like all the way down. And then season nine, 10, 11, and all of that stuff. These are just random PSD files that I haven't really put in there yet. Uh, so for something like 3D Total, when I work on their books, um, I'll have the projects that I've been doing, like uh, 100 hours, and then sketches that I've done for them, so, and and stuff like that. And even though you're working at home, like, I mean, you have, John, you know this, like freelancing, you can pretty much go wherever you want, whenever you want, but you still have to do your work. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, and it's... As long as you turn it in. As long as you turn it in. So it gets... Yeah, you might find yourself being away from your computer for three hours doing something like, well, got to do a rendering. So, uh, so yeah, that's what happens. <laughs> um, uh, part of his question, uh, Joe, was also wondering how you got into freelance. Oh, okay. That's actually a good question. So what I did was I, and this was back about five years ago, I started to become more active on the Internet. And it, it was proved very, very important because, one, you have to get your name out there. And that's one thing that freelancers have to do. It's all about marketing. You get your name out there and overcome the fear of people judging your work. Because once you put it out there, you have millions of people seeing it. <clears throat> it forces you to put only your best stuff out there because we're kind of stubborn. you know. We don't want to like change the things we know and what we want to do. So... I uh, I put my name out there. I really kept up with my sketch thread on conceptart.org. I started to open websites on many different places like DrawCrowd, which is a great site. Um, I believe Feng Zhu started that site. Uh, oh, Art, wow. Yeah, Feng Zhu started DrawCrowd, which is amazing. Um, Artstation.com, it's an it's a amazing site if you want to build a portfolio. Um, LinkedIn, which is very good for professionals to use. Get a lot of higher-ups and CEOs on LinkedIn. Um, what's another? So oh, Blogger. I have my own blog on Blogger. Um, and obviously Facebook. You. So I'm assuming that the people listening now are, they, they might be posting artwork on Facebook. Do it. Not only do that, set your public profile or set your uh, folders that you put your art into public. You, as an artist, you don't want to set it to closed or only friends or friends of friends because the more people that see your work, the better. And something I learned, I had to curate my Facebook. So 
when I became a professional freelancer, I had to stop posting stupid stuff on the internet. Um, <laughs> nobody cares about how much you can drink. Nobody cares about your political views. And nobody cares about your baby pics. Nobody cares about, well, they might care about baby pics and weddings. But um, only you have to treat it professionally because like, what you're showing is what you're going to get. And right now on Facebook, I seriously post drawings, and that's it. Um, you can have a separate Facebook just for your personal stuff, but I know a lot of artists, they have, they have like a fan page that they've built, so all their followers stay there, and then they have a personal one. But, you know, whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, and another place I have work on, let's see, I think those are my main sites. Oh, uh, Instagram and Twitter. Those are absolutely huge. I haven't, I've signed up for Reddit, don't really know how to use it yet because quite frankly I hate the layout, um, but I heard it's wonderful for artists. So the more places that you get on the internet, the better. Um, that's how I really got into it. I just kept drawing and kept putting my stuff out there. Uh, and the more I started putting myself out there, and going to conventions, which is absolutely huge. Another thing that you should do is make a business card. <clears throat> I can't tell you how many times I went to a cafe just to sketch. Somebody's like, hey, I like your drawings. Um, I want you to draw something for me. Or, hey, you want to meet this person? And you have to write your phone number down on a napkin. That's embarrassing. So, <laughs> yeah, always ha have a business card. I got mine from moo.com. You can get yours from like Vista Print too. Like all of that's good. So I kind of just rushed that. I know we're kind of running out of time here. Yeah. Um, it's, ho it's all hopefully good. that answered the question. Um, yes, it did. Okay, good. <laughs> <clears throat> awesome. Um, I guess I'll show a couple more pieces. Uh, let's see. Try to show, hmm, I'll go into my illustrations and I'll show you a, just a full-on illustration that I've done. So I don't do much of these. This is an older one. Uh, I did this in Corel Painter, not Photoshop. Now that I look at it, I could probably go back and work on it some more, but I draw really bizarre things and, and uh, this, was, this was just a forest keeper and has a a quiver of arrows on the back and a crossbow for a hand and a big crab hand. So, yeah. <laughs> I did do thumbnails and unfortunately the one thing that I was talking about actually happened. The external hard drive I, ha I had at the time, that started smoking and I lost my work. So all oh. I've had is this low res 72 DPI picture of this. I have no Photoshop anymore. No Photoshop file. So it's the only thing I have left. It's scary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> it's... Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, any more questions or? Yeah, we're just about to cl uh, close up soon. So, if you guys have any more questions, please feel free. Okay. <clears throat> um, trying to think of anything I can add into the whole freelancing bit. Uh,. Oh, yeah, one other thing. Um, don't hesitate to email art directors from companies that you want to work for. Just a, just email them and ask them, can you take a look at my portfolio? If they don't answer in like two or three weeks, that's normal, so don't freak out. Uh, art directors are super busy. So, um, yeah, it actually helps. You should be surprised at who answers back and gives you some really good feedback. Yeah. Awesome. I have uh, one last question for you. Um, yeah. Do you have any uh, like ha like daily habits uh, when it comes to your drawing or any anything like uh, that? Uh, yes. I always start traditionally. Like I I don't get warmed up by sitting at the tablet first and sketching that way. Um, I start with just taking my my pencil, sitting at my desk, and and just doodling the next thing that I want to do as far as a moleskin illustration. And then sometime during the day, I try to start a master copy. Um, 
most of my work lately has been environment drawings. Um, I can actually pull pull one up really quick if you want to see what actually I do. That would um, be great. Yeah. Let's see. So I'll show you. Let's see. Personal 21-day master study. Okay. So here's one by Thomas Moran. These were studies that I did from him. So the, the actual photo is on the left, and then the study was on the right. <coughs> no more than an hour spent. Maybe an hour and a half on, I think, this one. Uh, this one was an hour and a half just because I wanted to get the layout because I'm a perfectionist. Uh, so yeah, and then a new one I'm working on is more Thomas Moran studies. Let's see if that opens. Yeah, so I'm just kind of scribbling in some color. The one in the upper right here, that's the one I'm working on now, just splashing in some color. I didn't really finish this one. I might go back to it. Uh, it just really helps. I didn't use the eyedropper, and I just kept going. So I try to do those at least one a day. They say to do it one a day. I know these Nathan are... Fox does one a day. <laughs> yeah, these are awesome, man. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah, That's cool. Um, do you have a certain approach when you do these? Are you thinking about a certain thing, or do you just let it flow? Yeah, I do. This is what I do. Uh, okay, so I'm going to drag this photo down here. Actually, I'll... Okay, so I do... I get my brush ready. Um, I'll take my awesome sketch brush. And then I'll try to eyeball... I'm not, I'm not color picking the sky. I'll eyeball what I think that sky is. So somewhere... Ballpark... Desaturated blue, maybe a stronger one. If it's not... If it's not perfect, don't worry about it. Just don't eye drop. And then what I do is I try... Oh, hold on a second. Try to change the opacity. I color the sky first. And I... Don't worry about making the edges of the picture perfect. Nobody cares. It's for your practice. So I'll try to get that color in. <clears throat> and then I'll try to look at the main ground color. What color do I see the most? So I'll pick like this puke green, uh, this desaturated green, and then I'll cover the sky like that, or uh, the ground. So I have these two main colors, and then what I do, I can eye drop the color that I did, take me back to the blue, and then I just, I start playing with, uh, you know, what I see over there. I'll just start coloring like this. The first things you put down are not going to look like, I mean. There's a long, I have a long way to go for this. I have an hour. <laughs> of course, we don't have an hour, but there's an hour to go. And then pretty soon you'll start to see, you'll start to see a, a picture forming. You can put in like the water later. You can indicate where you want it. <clears throat> it looks like a crayon scribbles at first, but it, it really, it helps. So hopefully awesome. that helped. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Great. Well, we're just about ran out of time. Thank you so much, Bobby. Thank you guys for coming. Okay, thank you. And, um, yeah, have a great weekend, guys.